Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Ah, there it is. <laughs> um, welcome to our side event on accelerating digital climate services for resilient food systems in the global south. Um, we're going to give it a few more minutes just to get to wait, to let other people come in, and uh, then we'll get started. Thank you. All right, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to our event on accelerating digital climate services for resilient food systems in the global south. Um, my name is Martin Packer. I am the senior manager for advocacy and communications at the International Rice Research Institute, and I will be your MC for today. Um, we've got uh, several uh, speakers joining us uh, live and, vir and virtually as well. Um, and I will uh, really just not Without any further ado, just uh, introduce our very first speaker, which is Dr. Amjad Babu. Uh, Amjad is working with the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, the Bangladesh office uh, in Dhaka, and he will be doing our first presentation. Uh, thank you so. Thank you so much for coming. So before talking about digital climate services, I, I want to take you to the context why digital services are really important. So first of all, we need to understand the downward spiral that farm families are facing right now in all over the globe. So you think about a farmer in Horn of Africa fa uh, cultivating maize and facing a drought or a farmer in Pakistan facing floods, or even a farmer, wheat farmer uh, facing terminal heat stress for his wheat crop in Bangladesh. So all these farmers will lose a part of their production or complete production. That will lead to a production shock and also an income shock. This is leading to, a, uh, to, to, to push them to take credits for the next crop cycle and what is happening is they are coming to a spiral of debt. And once they're indebted, they are unable to invest in adaptation measures and they are you know, becoming more vulnerable. So when they're vulnerable, when the next shocks, when the, you know, because of climate change, the number of or frequency of you know, climate events are increasing. So what happens is uh, the, the spiral goes, gets kicks in, kicks in and then because of the indebtedness, they are moving towards the first stage of migration, that is the male of the household, or even females in some cases in Vietnam, for example, they are migrating to cities and trying to get some money so that they can pay, pay back these debts. And then once more and more events are happening, they will reach at the point of no economic recovery. So what happens is at the end, the whole, fami whole farm family abandons the place and migrates to cities or anywhere they could find. So this is a downward spiral I'm talking about. This spiral can be stopped using a sort of a, a set of solutions. So the first important solution is a, a transition to low carbon world. So that's what we are talking about, reduce the frequency of the events. But otherwise, the first important measure is to introduce climate resilient technologies and also climate services, because it can act at the friend of this cycle. 
uh, the, the, the spiral can be stopped at the beginning because we are providing information or we are providing the technology so that farm families reduce the production shocks. So it will reduce the cost of all other interventions, let it be loss and damage compensation or finance or even social security net expenditure. So that's why we have to invest in climate services as an important uh, element here. So I just want to take you to the Bangladesh uh, case. Uh, the right hand side, what you're seeing is this multiple stress map. The lines here are indicating the path of cyclones of the recent cyclone events. Uh, each line is a cyclone. And also the color, colored area, you can see that it's uh, the, the drought levels, moderate, severe, and very severe drought events. And the checker lines are actually different kinds of floods. So, and including tidal floods, that means salinity too. You can see that how much stress this land is. And we can actually help farmers by giving forecasted information about these events, but how to reach millions of farmers. It's only through digital means, otherwise we cannot reach them. So that's why we need to have uh, digital systems in place to inform them so that they can take informed decisions. Uh, if you look at this uh, map, what I'm presenting to you in the right-hand side is uh, you know, uh, the maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and rainfall patterns of over an year. This is a decision framework of a farmer in Bangladesh. And it, you can see that the lines below is actually the cropping uh, calendar. So different crops, and you can see them, but it's actually like maize, wheat, mung bean, uh, rice, wheat, uh, you know, so on. So you can see that the temperature is actually, you know, temperature and so rainfall are breaching some of the biological threshold points of these crops. So actually we can find, if you have forecast, we can find in advance that what kind of uh, biological stress can happen in next week or within few days or even weeks ahead. And we can actually inform them beforehand so that farmers can take appropriate measures. For example, in the seeding, he, he, the, if there is no rainfall for next two weeks, it's better not to seed, delay the seeding decision. You know, or you think about harvesting. In case of harvesting, you are, there is a heavy rainfall happening, and you can inform them so that they can harvest the crop. So all these decisions can be informed, and we can, uh, I, I'll tell you an example how we created that kind of information system and in, you know, connected the farmers digitally. Uh, so, but we need large scale investment in this uh, uh, digital services, and also the meteorological forecast behind these uh, uh, systems must be robust. And uh, our colleague uh, John Furlow will be talking about uh, the meteorological forecast and its uh, in importance of investing in it. So there are different kinds of technologies, mobile apps, web-based services, or interactive voice response systems, which can actually uh, take this uh, into to farmers. Uh, I'm telling you an example of Agwisely. This is a system we generated in case of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, we have a grid-based forecast coming into our system. Our system can ingest this grid-based forecast and create uh, 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 locational-specific advisory and species-specific advisory so that each uh, crop can be, crop farmer can be informed about what is going to happen next few days and they can take appropriate information now around 6,000 extension officers are using it and informing almost uh, 200 farmers each uh, from, uh, uh, from this uh, mobile platform. Uh, similarly, there is, uh, you know, there is in not enough, uh, enough investment is coming to uh, livestock. Crop sector is actually getting covered uh, in large, there are some initiatives in this regard, but livestock is com completely out of scope right now, and we are actually working on what kind of decisions can be supported. So, but there are so many decisions that can be supported in the livestock, so we are mapping them out and creating a system. Uh, we'll be soon releasing a first uh, livestock advisory system uh, in Bangladesh, so that can be modeled for many other countries. And this also can be 
uh, informed farmers by voice calls or apps and there are different system but here in livestock we need so much of uh, additional investment because there's nothing existing so far uh, another presentation by Romana will be explaining about the aquaculture, uh, how we have tried aquaculture's climate services, which are also unique experiment in the world. So uh, it, ca it should be taken to other countries too. Um, regarding the new initiatives, CGIR initiatives, especially transforming agri-food systems in South Asia and also Asian Mega Deltas initiative, we are actually taking it to the next level where we are actually working along the value chain, including R&D, seed production, or in case of livestock or fish is breed, and production harvesting, up to retail and consumer level, all along the value chain, what are the climate information required? How I can create an ecosystem of services which can actually benefit the whole value chain? There, are, there, is, a number of, uh, there is a number of initiatives, digital initiative coming in the, in the retail and uh, after post-production sector actually, and we can actually complement their efforts and make, uh, make, it, make the, the synergistic effect. So we, don't, we have very much, so many unknowns are there in, in terms of uh, what is required in the value chain. So we are working on that. Soon uh, we'll be able to create new services and create a new ecosystem of services. This, needs to be con uh, this is done in Southeast Asia, especially Cambodia, Vietnam, and all those countries, including Myanmar. Uh, this uh, 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 you know uh, uh, mapping is being done and one more thing we are trying to do is the business models because the sustainability of climate service is a major issue and it has to be addressed and uh, we, we see that this is possible by help of uh, we are do doing some kind of living experiments where with the digital uh, digital uh, applications and we are in, for example the finance sector is in interested in protecting their investment we are inviting them to experiment with the digital services, and then we are finding out a value proposition. What, what kind of pr value proposition we can create uh, using these uh, uh, digital systems, and then making sure that uh, they can be sustained by themselves by generating money. So uh, these are the, you know, in nutshell, what I want to present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amjad. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ramana Hussain from uh, World Fish International, based out of Dhaka uh, in Bangladesh as well. And Dr. Hussain specializes in climate change and aquatic food systems. And she's going to be speaking to us about the challenges and opportunities that are faced in aquaculture for digital climate services. Thank you, Martin. And, uh uh, good afternoon to all who joined us here and also online. So as Martin said, I will be presenting on uh, accelerating digital climate services for resilient uh, food systems in Global South, particularly focusing on uh, aquatic food systems. So when we are uh, talking about climate information services, what actually does it mean for, for aquatic food systems? We know that uh, uh, Global South is highly vulnerable to climate change and variabilities, uh, uh, to clim uh, variabilities and extremes as well, like a seasonal signature of extreme heat, uh, heavy and mean precipitation changes, floods and cyclones are few among those challenges. But how these are uh, affecting the aquatic food systems? It, 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 all these variabilities, climate variabilities, is affecting the aquatic environment and aquatic uh, uh, food system as a whole, uh, which you can, you can see uh, through this uh, diagram as well. So when the hydroclimatic variables are getting affected by these climatic variabilities, the uh, lives within the, uh, uh, within the aquatic environment, they also get affected. And uh, the result is like for food system, if you think about the food system, the result is that uh, it, it, it affects the digestion capacity of the aquatic lives, it, it uh, affects the food intake behavior, it affects the survival rate, and, uh, yeah, and it, it, it also affects the growth, and, and uh, it also has impact on a disease outbreak, and uh, finally uh, with the production, uh, whole production system. 
So what we did, we, we uh, having, um, uh, knowing all these impacts uh, of uh, climate uh, variabilities, impacts on aquatic food system, we first tried to identify some climate sensitive uh, aquaculture operations. Uh, and we, we initiated it in Bangladesh first. And uh, after identifying the aquaculture, uh, uh, climate sensitive aquaculture operations, we identified the uh, climate sensitive management decisions that how we can uh, minimize those, uh, uh, those climate variabilities induced risks, uh, taking the modified management decision using the climate information, you know. So what we did, um, that showed that uh, uh, we, we, there is a, a platform we, we uh, jointly developed, uh, it is X Wisely, and the platform has uh, different tabs, like for the food systems. And that showed that it has agriculture, now uh, he has been working on livestock, and we work also on the aquatic food systems to add there. And initially we worked on four fish species uh, where we identified the climatic thresholds for that four fi fish species so that uh, when the climate information will trigger uh, that decision, uh, so, sorry, that um, thresholds so, so that it can uh, uh, generate the services for the fish farmers so that they can minimize the risks. So we started with the uh, five-day lead time so that uh, we can provide the climate information five days before so that f the farmers can, uh, can uh, uh, modify their uh, management decisions to manage those risks. And we started with Bangladesh. We also scaled this to India, and now we are working in Zambia as well. We, we are scaling our knowledge to, from Bangladesh to other regions as well. And, uh, we had also uh, worked on a bit on seasonal climate information services. It's not only the day-to-day -day climate information services, that how it can work for seasonal uh, management decision. And, it, uh, and uh, it, this is from uh, one, of, one of our uh, paper uh, findings that seasonal climate information services also can help to make the decisions like uh, what would be the production volume when uh, the farmer uh, will uh, d decide to uh, stock their fingerlings or, or the husbanding, uh, harvesting schedule. So these are kind of uh, 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 seasonal management decisions which can be supported by seasonal climate information services as well. So, so far so good, but what we need to do more. That, and this, this uh, uh, work actually, I would say, is a very pioneer for aquatic food systems, and we work only in aquaculture. And what we, uh, well, our findings show some, some interesting results you can see here, that 1% increase in aquaculture production by managing climate risks using climate information services can provide 24,000 tons of fish for catering 1 million people uh, with protein in context of uh, Bangladesh. This, is, uh, this study was uh, conducted in context of Bangladesh. And what does it mean, actually? It, it means that climate information services, it, it is not only having imp uh, contributing to manage climate risk, it is also contributing to food and nutrition security as well. So uh, our, another study we conducted is uh, particularly to have a look on the economic value of uh, aquaculture climate information services. Uh, because when we started working, uh, yeah, it, it was a very small grant and we had a very limited uh, working space within that scope. Uh, so if we want to move it, take it further, then how, how, how we can uh, go, go forward? So we did this study to uh, to, uh, for, the, for the evaluation of from the economic uh, uh, point of view, and it show, shows that 14 million uh, US dollar per year uh, uh, is the potential economic value of aquaculture climate information services. And it is uh, only, f uh, only uh, offsetting by 10% uh, of the damage which is, uh, uh, which is uh, occurring from climate variabilities. So, so knowing that, we, 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 we acknowledge that um, 
uh, availability of actionable climate transformation services and practice of context specific uh, 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 services for aquaculture are, are actually in a stage of infancy. And uh, we have a lot to do in this because the model we worked uh, in Bangladesh, it, 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 it has some uh, limitations like data. We didn't have data. We didn't have uh, um, uh, reference points information in a way we, we wanted to, uh, to develop it, but we, we are, we are, uh, uh, we, th so there is a lot uh, more to work on this. So what we need to do uh, uh, based on the works we already, uh, we have already done, that uh, what we uh, see that uh, uh, data collection systems we uh, used to, to provide the advisories, we, uh, uh, it's, uh, let me explain it first. We, we, we are getting the climate information data as for example from Bangladesh uh, Meteorological Department. But uh, that's the air temperature or rainfall information. But how we will transfer this uh, information for the aquatic food producers? We, uh, we need the um, uh, water temperatures, you know. So we, we developed a, a system uh, from, we selected some reference ponds to provide the input from the uh, uh, water temperature, water temperature in input from this reference ponds to the system so that it can uh, modify the, uh, it can convert the air temperature into the water temperature forecast. However, that's, that was manual at, within this sco uh, project scope. So we need to develop, we need to set up some IoT things there so that the data input system it, it gets automated and we, we, we do not need to uh, 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 involve, uh, I mean, uh, manpower to, to, to provide the data on a daily basis. So for the sustainability of that system, we need to uh, set up the IoT system there. And also uh, large scale capacity building initiatives. Because we, we what um, our Bangladesh experience showed that most of the fish farmers, most of the fish uh, producers, they do not actually have the idea of uh, uh, this type of inform using this type of information and um, making such kind of management decisions. So there is a scope to, uh, uh, we need to build the capacity of the uh, small scale fish farmers to, so that uh, they, they, uh, they can manage their risk in day to day operations. So finally, uh, policy level in inclusion. It is, it is important for mainstreaming, you know, because uh, recently we had a, uh, uh, we, 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 we have been working on uh, Department of Fisheries in Bangladesh to, f to revise the policy. So our experience showed that we had three dialogues and it, it shows that we, there, uh, there is a need to include the climate uh, information service, mitigation and adaptation, all these things to, in, to get into the policy so that it, it can be mainstream. And finally, uh, uh, financial inclusion. That's very important because we know without uh, the financial assistance, we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot move forward. So thank you all. That's all from my side. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Romana. Um, our next speaker is going to be joining us virtually from Nairobi, uh, Dr. Evan Gervetz from the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SEAT. And <clears throat> Evan is a, is a COP veteran, and he will be sharing with us his perspectives on accelerating climate services for food systems transformation. Um, Evan, the floor is yours. Very sorry for not being able to be there in person. Um, I was there last week, uh, the first week of COP, and unfortunately couldn't stay for the second, but uh, pleasure to be here virtually with you. Um, I, I'm gonna talk to you today, um, share with you some, some stories of work that we're doing um, on delivering bundled digi digital advisory services to African farmers at scale. And uh, to, to start the presentation, um, I'd like to, to pull back the curtains a bit here and uh, talk about how we can use TV and video, I think, in a very powerful way for delivering our messages about uh, climate information and agro-advisory services to farmers. Um, we work with a, a show called the Shamba Shape Up uh, TV show. It uh, was started in Kenya over a decade ago. Uh, it's a farm makeover TV show. Maybe some of you have heard about it. Um, the, the TV show goes on to farms. They, they go find real farmers. 
Um, they talk to them about the, the real problems that they have, and then they bring in real experts uh, to talk to them about what kinds of things they can do. And like I said, it's been going on for over a decade. And more recently, they've really seen the, the challenge that climate, um, both the variability year to year, as well as climate change, is posing to the farmers uh, in Kenya. And so climate adaptation in particular has been a real focus of many of the shows, and that's some of the work that we've been doing with them is to bring climate smart agriculture agriculture and other kinds of advisories into this show. Uh, there's over 8 million uh, viewers a week that watch the show in Kenya. It's it's uh, showed in both English and Swahili, the, the, the main local language, uh, or at least both of those are, are languages that are spoken throughout Kenya. Um, and broadcasts in both languages on national TV um, on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and after the show is done, um, the, the, the the show themselves goes and interviews some of the people that have watched it, um, and they do an assessment that's called knowledge, attitude, and practices, and, uh, and to see how that has changed, how has uh, their knowledge about some sort of technology around climate smart agriculture changed, um, how has their attitude about wanting to use that change, and how have they actually changed their practices. And um, it, it's, it's impressive that um, over 80% of viewers uh, change their knowledge in some ways, um, and they have evidence that 40% of them actually change something on their farm based on watching the TV show. So it has a real impact um, on the people that, that, that watch the show. They've also shown that um, there was $24 million in benefits to dairy farmers um, with, with one uh, show that was was, was done um, some years ago. A study from Bakkenhagen University showed this where they did a proper impact assessment. Um, and then finally, I want to make the point that they've also interviewed different people who have either watched the show or not and have shown that watching TV TV is, is one of the most trusted sources of information for people. And I think, you know, people often go and watch TV and they, they get a lot from it, sometimes good, sometimes not. Um, but it's very trusted, um, actually more than, than even radio, although that's also quite trusted, um, and, and much more than um, agro dealers and even their families and friends. So it's a, a very effective way to get the, the uh, information across in this type of uh, digital video format. Um, now I want to move to something new and innovative that this show is doing, which is to bring a weather segment on. Um, this is work that's been done with Plant Village, uh, with ourselves at the Alliance of Biodiversity and in, in, in SEAT, um, in partnership with the, the Kenya Met Department. Um, and, and so it's been piloted over the last year to bring this kind of uh, weather forecast information onto the TV show in a short uh, five minute or less segment. Um, and, and what we're now working on is how we can better tailor this to address the needs of those that are watching and to, and to have the information um, be more actionable for how they can better manage their farms in the sense of linking this weather forecast to different kinds of climate smart agriculture and other innovation uh, interventions that farmers can be uh, doing on their on their farms. Um, now, this here, this this TV show um, is then linked with a mobile platform called iShamba. Um, I should say Shamba means uh, small farm in Swahili, and that's that's why it's called Shamba Shape Up, that you're shaping up your farm, and the iShamba digital mobile platform. It's an SMS-based platform uh, so that it can reach uh, the broadest audience out there, um, and uh, there's a, a bunch of different services that, that can be brought to farmers uh, through this, including weather forecasts that we've been working with the TV show on. And so I think there's a, a real powerful combination of combining um, the, the TV video with this kind of digital platform where farmers can sign up, give information about where they live, the kind of farm or what, 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 what they're farming, what value chains they're engaged in, um, as well as to ask questions. There's also a call center that, that they can um, call into. And, and so here's some of the functions of this digital platform that we're working with um, to bring improved weather information to farmers because you know their location based on their village and can provide that information um, to provide messaging on, on crops and how they can be climate smart and um, get a link with advisory weather forecasts, for example, to advise on planting dates. Um, to target specific farmers and, for example, vulnerable areas. And I mentioned a, a call hotline um, that they can call to ask about specific ag and, and climate issues. And, and there's been hundreds of thousands of phone calls that have made to this to this line. Um, and then also bringing in other kinds of services. I men mentioned in the in the uh, the the the, um, uh, the title about bundling other kinds of services, such as insurance or loans, in, into this.
Um, so this I'm describing here, I see this as a multimedia digital delivery ecosystem that can be fostered around uh, TV. Um, radio, actually, I didn't mention, but in Uganda, they're also using radio that they adapt the TV shows to radio using the mobile platforms. And I think there's a lot of other that can of, of others that can come around this and different services then that can be bundled in with this. And, and so we've talked about climate information, um, both short term uh, uh, weather forecasts, but also the seasonal forecasts, which I think are, are, are very important for farmers. And, and one of the times they can really make you know, good decisions on what kind of variety to, 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 to grow. Agro advisory services can provide that kind of information. They can have access to inputs through these kind of platforms, market linkages, and as I mentioned, microfinance like credit and insurance. Um, now, this is great, I think, to have this kind of platform here, and, and, and it's, it's a, I think, a big innovation to be able to do this. But um, I think it's important also not to forget the importance of engaging on the ground, that digital platforms are important, but I think the real power can come when we link them um, to local engagement. And so some of the work that we've done in Latin America, as well as in Africa, for example, here in Rwanda, is to work through what we call local techno technical advisory committees. Um, and, and the way that uh, this works here, sorry about this, um, the way that this works is that um, the, the local technical advisory committees can understand, sorry, I'm having some trouble here with uh, the, the Zoom blocking some things and hitting the keyboard. Um, th th these local technical advisory committees help to understand uh, what the farmers are doing on the ground, the context that they have, and then to bring climate and crop modeling information to those farmers, and, and then to have a dialogue with them about what does this mean for how they're farming in their village, on their farm, and then to, to decide on what kind of options to implement based on these seasonal or short-term forecasts, but normally seasonal forecasts that they'd be looking at in these cases, and then to monitor and learn from these. And, and so then where I was going here with this, this, this final slide is to say that I think really think, again, the power comes from how we can link this kind of multimedia digital delivery ecosystem with TV, radio, mobile uh, platforms, um, different kinds of bundled services that come around that, and then linking that to the ground to different kinds of um, advisors that are out there in the field um, through these kind of local technical advisory committees. And so I'm excited to see how we can take this kind of model and scale it out because I think it has an opportunity for, for real power and scale. And we're already seeing it in, in, in Rwanda where it's reaching millions of farmers and opportunities to be scaled out to other countries. Um, in Kenya, where I was mentioning the TV show reaching over 8 million farmers. And so with that, I'd like to thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, our final presentation is John Furlow from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at the Columbia University Climate School. And John is going to be telling us briefly about the importance of strengthening institutions for securing sustainability through digital climate services. So John, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear myself. Um, are there going to be slides? Ah, look at that. Um, okay. Ah, there we go. It's magic. So I want to. We saw some great examples of what can happen when you have good information, sort of at the core of the climate service. Um, but we find in a lot of countries that people aren't even aware that may not be aware that there is a meteorological service, and the meteorological service, which is at the core of the climate service because they produce information, is often uh, underfunded, misunderstood. Um, I don't want to speak ill of them, but they sometimes are not, the people who staff them are not the most communicative people. Um, and so they get into a situation that I've tried to show here where it takes resources to produce high quality services, but if you're in the finance ministry, you don't want to give the resources to the, to the meteorological agency unless they're producing high quality services. So they're kind of stuck in the bottom. They need the resources to produce the service, but they need to demonstrate the service in order to win the resources at budget time. So they get stuck in kind of a, a vicious cycle. And what we want to do is flip that and get them into a virtuous circle or a growth curve. So often an outside group, uh, a USAID or a CGIAR, will come in and provide some resources to develop a tool. Ideally, the Met Service will show that they can do it. They'll move forward on both the resource and the utility path, and then they'll do it again and again, and they work their way up. They'll probably never get to the, in a developing country, they sh won't and shouldn't get to the level of a NOAA or a UK Met, but they can become a functional, viable, valuable resource 
to the more powerful ministries in the government that support agriculture, uh, the finance ministry, the water authority, et cetera. We've seen another, another version of this um, climate service uh, cycle. The powerful ministries, the places where the value is really added is at the right-hand end of that value chain, but it starts with the provision of the information. So again, you want to protect the, the, the meteorological agency so that it can provide the input, whether it's for index insurance or for agro-advisories or whatever. So you need to find champions. You want to let the powerful ministries understand that their success is dependent on the meteorological agency and on the data that it provides. This is a quote I did some work uh, about 10 years ago in Jamaica. Um, the fellow there in the picture used to be the finance minister in Jamaica. He was one of the most powerful people in the government. Um, and at the end of this two-day workshop on uh, weather and climate information and the, and the Jamaican economy, he came up to me and said, you know, when you guys invited me, I thought you had made a mistake. I thought you wanted Pickersgill, who was the environment minister. But now that I've been here for two days learning about this, I want to know why somebody wasn't talking to me about this 20 years ago. Because this climate stuff, that affects everything that I'm responsible for. This is my issue. It's not an environment issue. And he became a huge advocate for doing something about uh, the climate. And then when it's working well, this guy is uh, President Mackey Saul of Senegal. Um, the IRI worked with the Senegal Met Department um, and helped them produce a seasonal climate forecast. It made its way to the president. He saw that it was going to be a good rain year. So he ordered an increase in investment in inputs for agriculture of about 50%. And the result was that Senegal had record harvests, farmer incomes went up, and they did not have to import any food in 2020. And often, Senegal will have to import up to half of its food. So this is what we're trying to accomplish, uh, but it, it, until the powerful ministries understand that they really do depend on the small little meteorological service, the support may not be there, and then the information and the data won't won't be there at the beginning of that value chain. And if it's not there at the beginning, the end of the value chain is not enabled. So, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to all of our panelists, uh, both here and, uh, and virtually. Now, to facilitate the next section of this event, I'd like to invite my colleague, John Helen, from the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and the CGIR Climber Initiative. John will also be providing some insights on the social equity dimension of climate services for resilient food systems. John. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, and thanks all presenters. Am I close enough? Thanks all presenters for uh, really stimulating um, presentations and food for thought. I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about the social e equity dimensions of, of this work and any work we're involved in. And I go back to the IPCC report which came out in February on vulnerability and impacts. And there's a very big stress on transformative adaptation, tackling the root causes of vulnerability. And part of the climate response, as we've heard today, very much revolves around climate information services, digital services, etc. But the IPCC also drew attention to the dangers of maladaptation, where farmers are not homogenous. Historically, some groups of farmers have been able to benefit from any sorts of interventions in the past, soil and water conservation. Now we talk about climate resilience, climate smart agriculture. So just thinking about the dangers of maladaptation and the fact that there could be winners and losers. Clearly a lot of emphasis on gender, but it also goes beyond gender. There's youth, are people, are women from a certain ethnic group further disadvantaged and unable to uh, take advantage of digital services? And we'll be tackling this issue around the digital divide later on. Now, I know that we started five minutes late, so I'm going to take the liberty of going beyond five minutes past half the hour. We want to do things slightly differently in this session. 
we've had four presentations. We want to engage both the panelists and you, the audience, and I'm not sure we can do it with a virtual audience, to talk around four questions which have we've pre-cooked. So if we could have the first two questions coming up on the screen, please. And what we're going to do, can you do it for me? We're going to have two questions coming up on the screen. The first one, should digital climate services be a right of farmers? Will it hamper private investments? The four presentations, be it around Bangladesh, aquatic food systems, Evan talking about the situation in Africa, John with Jamaica, Senegal, and the importance of institutions. Clearly, climate information services, digital services, have a major fundamental role to play in the climate response. Should that be a right? And I'm just going to quickly direct that at Evan to provide succinctly a few words, and then I'd like to draw in the audience with any thoughts they might have as to that first question. So Evan, talking from your home or office in Nairobi, quickly, what are your thoughts on whether climate services are a right fostered by government, will that then stymie private sector engagement? Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, actually, greetings from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Ilri campus here. Um, I, I think in, in some ways the answer to that depends. I, I, I think what is a right is to have the opportunity uh, to Im improve your agricultural uh, activities, um, to improve your livelihood, and, and to have those, those opportunities come to you. Um, I think depending on the kind of service, there may be a, a, a right to it or, or not. I mean, for example, I would say um, I don't necessarily think that a credit product or an insurance product that, that would be risk informed and, and, and could help with, with climate in some ways is maybe appropriate for every single farmer that's out there. And so I think it's making sure that uh, farmers are, do have the access to the, the kind of information that they need that can help them uh, to improve their livelihoods um, and, 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 and their, their farm enterprises. Um, I, I, I also want to point out that there are some kinds of services, and I'll say like the Shamba Shave Up TV show um, that is broadcast nationally on TV, um, how radio can be used and other types of services like that, um, which we see coming up and I think are you know a, a right, if you will, for everybody to be able to access and getting that kind of information to them. I think it is very important. And then around that, again, being able to provide the opportunities for them um, to uh, get the services that they need, be it um, the improved inputs that could be more uh, drought tolerant for a certain context and for them to be able to have the information to know that they should be uh, using th those kind of uh, varieties, say, of, of, of crops. So um, I think I'd say that it depends, but I do think that um, it is a right to have this kind of information. Um, and I think that there is a role for the public sector in terms of some of the basic information to get out there. Um, but then I think that there is also a strong role for the private sector. Um, and I, I see that emerging. The TV show I talked about is a private enterprise itself, and they get sponsorship to come on to highlight the kinds of things um, that, that they're promoting on the TV show. Um, but then again, I think that should be complemented with public services to provide the base kind of information through um, MET agencies uh, that are enabled, for example, as we, as we just heard talked about there. So let me pass it back over to you and I'd be happy to follow up with more comments later as there's time. So what I was, what I was picking up from that is, I mean, maybe talking about it as a right is dis distracting us from the challenge, which is actually to mean, make sure that there are greater users, greater access. And I know I was struck by your Shamba shake up, shape up when you refer to 8 million viewers, which is a substantial number. So on this topic of um, whether it's a right, before we go into question two, any comments from the audience, please don't be shy, but um, anything you would like to add, and if you could keep it succinct, you would make my life a lot easier. Ajit, short and precise. Hi everyone, uh, this is Ajit from ICADA. I'm also working in the digital ag space and work with John in Morocco and Senegal. Um, so what I think, I mean also working in the excellence in agronomy in Egypt where digital augmentation is the key. 
Uh, what I think is that engaging partnerships with par private sector is extremely important because you know we can develop fantastic tools, but in order to scale that and to reach the, uh, the, the stakeholders, the farmers, we definitely need private engagement. And uh, of course, the, there is a caveat to it, uh, that is private sector has their own vested interests. So there could be an issue of polarizing information uh, but definitely, in order to scale, we need the engagement with public, uh, the private sector. Okay, thank you, Ajit. One more, and then please, and then we'll move on. What Ajit's just said actually segues very nicely into the second of these questions. Yeah, I think these digital climate services absolutely are right. And to reframe this question, thinking about Hurricane Ida, which just landed in the United States, if people didn't know that that hurricane was coming, that's just... It's unthinkable, really. Like, I followed that hurricane for a week well before it made landfall, and the impacts would have been so much more severe had they not had the information in advance. The private sector can play a role in the optimization of the selection of crops, the mode of transportation, or the region of consumption, but knowing what weather is coming is essential to a dignified and a fruitful uh, economy and mode of production. Yep, and I don't think anyone would disagree with you, and I'm based in the Philippines, and deaths from typhoons are hugely reduced by excellent climate, climate information services when those typhoons come in. So it affects the US, Philippines, everywhere. Let's, let's segue into that second question. Amjat, this is for, for you. A um, lot of great work in Bangladesh, extremely active private sector, setting the way, really, for, um, for digital services. Um, how does one incentivize even more the engagement of the private sector in climate services? It's on now. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, John. Uh, what I wanted to say was, you know, we have to think in a bit different direction here. There are many skeptics. I mean, there are many skeptics. Uh, towards how climate services can be a private, uh, you know, service. Uh, I mean, we need to find the correct value proposition of climate services. So if you look at these studies, especially willingness to pay studies among farmers, you see that is really low. And why? Is it, is it because they don't value it? It's not like that. It's because they have very limited money and there are so many other demands of it. Did, will a farmer pay for the climate service or will he give it for educating his child? So there is a trade-off. It's not because of the value that is created by the service, but it's uh, because they are unable to do that. So the private sector has to think about how we can create a value and then take economic benefit out of it. For example, in case of finance, if uh, finance sector uh, is trying to provide climate information to farmers. They can actually secure their investments. You no, know, the farmers are borrowing, and if they are not giving back that money, then they are in trouble. So, what I mean is that if the finance sector re re understands this, they can actually pay for that service and protect their investment. It's like an insurance for them. So, there is a clear business model. They don't need to charge any farmers, but they can still provide it. And also, same with the seed sector. If seed is uh, increasing the output, they have to protect it. They have to show that, OK, this is 20% increase in yields. If the, it is damaged by a climate event, then you are not going to realize it. So we have talked to seed sector, and also, for example, growth promoters. So in case of uh, legumes, in case of legumes, we, the pro growth promoter was very much willing to provide climate service, that means harvest warnings to farmers to make sure that the increased yields are protected. So. We have to look at business-to-business -business models, especially, so that this kind of service can be provided to farmers without uh, maybe a partial contribution from farmers can be expected. So the private sector needs to understand how can we create more value and how to, like uh, Ivan said, maybe also a bundle service. It should be bundled with something, some service or a product. Then it makes a clear value proposition. And then uh, private sectors can easily take it up. So that's my uh, take in this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amjat. 
Um, any interventions, thoughts from the audience on this question as to how one can accelerate investments in the private sector? I will let you get away with one more intervention, Ajit, because you're a friend of mine, but then we have to let others. Uh, over sorry to you. for that. I just want to um, uh, point out that in most of the country, developing countries, uh, we don't have a very uh, robust extension system, especially from the public sector. Uh, as I'm talking the case of uh, Egypt, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, they don't have an elaborate uh, outreach uh, wing and uh, they heavily rely on uh, services uh, that are offered by the private sector. The same case with Morocco, the private sector is playing a great role in uh, 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 taking the task of uh, the go government for the extension. So e uh, from the e-extension point of view, uh, that is where uh, the government can attract the private, uh, various private sectors. Um, so that's one way. Thank, thank you, thank you for that, Ajit. For the sake of time, I'd like to move on to the third and fourth questions, and I want to try and link the two. So I'm going to be provocative here. We talk about extension services. We talk about government. We talk about private sector. We all know that not all farmers are attractive clients for the private sector. So the provocative question would be, if we go down the route of greater private sector engagement in the provision of digital services, are we in danger of exacerbating that digital divide, which comes back to the social equity? And others might have a different perspective, so I want to turn to Romana to address this question of whether I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, as we say, and whether there really is no danger of digital climate services falling into the trap of digital divides, which may be gender or caste or ethnicity. Romana. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, before uh, answering uh, this question, I would like to uh, focus on where we are on digital climate information services, you know. If, if we need to uh, get into the third floor of a seven-storied building, we need to start from the ground floor, then first and second. So I see that climate information services status, we are still at the ground floor, you know. So we, this is, I'm staring it, uh, I, I'm sharing it in, this way because, uh, yes, uh, if, you, if I look at in Bangladesh, you know, that 75% of the uh, population ha have, is getting in, uh, um, uh, internet access and they're using it. It's very recent statistics. And the, the rest 25% may or may not getting the internet access. So if, we, uh, if I see these statistics from uh, aquaculture's perspective or aquatic food system per per perspective, the, uh, the uh, small scale farmers, uh, if I select the small scale farmers, they, that, that percentage is very small who are not using cli digital climate information services. And our, uh, uh, during uh, our survey in 2019, we, we didn't see that divide, you know. Most of the farmers are, are, are uh, using uh, their mobile device. It may or may not be using the internet, but we, those who are not getting uh, uh, internet uh, connections, we are, we are trying to leverage our, uh, our government departments to, to send those services yep. to those farmers. Yep. So that's a quick uh, yeah, no, feedback on that. Thank yeah. you very much. Romana, and before I turn to the audience, um, try and, I'd like to just try and broaden that digital divide uh, thought because what Romana said was very interesting. In Bangladesh, 75% with access to, to the internet. In the Philippines, where I'm based, one of the issues around the digital divide has actually been around uh, age. And a lot of older farmers who, a bit like me, struggle with new innovative digital tools. So what um, people have been trying to do is to use their children to help their parents understand, interpret, and benefit from the digital tools. And the school kids are being referred to as infomediaries. So the digital divide doesn't always have to be gender, could be also over youth. 
Bangladesh is a great example of a very, very extensive digitally literate population. Would anyone in the audience like to provide any insights from their own experiences as to whether there is a danger of a digital divide when it comes to the provision of climate information services? <coughs> Uh, hello everyone, I'm Tasfia. I work with the International Center for Climate Change and Development uh, based in Bangladesh. Uh, and I'm also part of a project on climate services working with IRI, CIMIT, and Bangladesh Meteorological Department. So for this answer, these two questions, I'll answer this together. Uh, the first answer is yes. It creates the digital device as, as uh, we just heard like on all the uh, issues that have been already shared because of the social dimensions, cultural dimensions, like many other things, as well as economic things as well. But uh, to ensure, but without di going digitally, it is impossible to reach out to mass audience. It is also true. So for this, it is very important to create institutional as well as individual capacity building, which we are exactly trying to do through the our one kind of platform which we are calling Bangladesh Academy for Climate Services. Uh, here we are uh, working in three modality where we uh, convene stakeholders to understand the needs and gaps and then we go for professional uh, t uh, t uh, mentoring and training to in a, in, a, in a dialogue modality and thirdly we, we are also integrating those learnings in the education level curricula. So that is very important because um, uh, uh, to, to, re to reduce the gap uh, on the digital divide, it is very important that we, we work on the very uh, bottom level of capacity building and go, go from that tire. So Thank I'll stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. And I guess one of the lessons from that is to reduce the gap, you first of all got to acknowledge that there is a gap, and that's the first step. I'm conscious of time. We've got about seven, eight minutes if we go one hour from when we started. The last question is the, is the one about quality. And I'm going to turn to John on this. I really like the graph about the, the, the vicious circle, you know, the, the UA, UK Met Office, NOAA, with very high quality. But the, the, the sort of more national meteorological organizations, um, quality is imperative for them to increase users with good information. So. How do we ensure that quality of digital climate services? What are the, the technical, the institutional, financial mechanisms to ensure quality? Sure, I think, I think the most important thing is to have a functional relationship between the community and the producers of the information. So is there a good relationship between the agriculture ministry or the Ag, Ext Ag Extension Service and the meteorological agency and any intermediaries. And I think this would apply whether the information is going out through a digital platform or through paper or radio or whatever, um, so that there is that feedback loop so that if, if the wrong, if the right information is not getting out or it's not getting out on time, the, the producers of the information understand and are under some pressure to adjust. I wanted to make a quick comment on the first question about the right. I just wanted to note that most of the climate, the basic climate information is produced by the government. So it's a public service and, well, at least in the U.S., taxpayers have a right to what they're paying for. And so, at a, you know, that it doesn't mean that they have the right necessarily to, to it, to the information as it's getting tailored by private providers but they should have access to the basic information and then everyone should try to make sure they can access it in a usable form. Thank you very much for that. And of course, linking that back to your, the question about quality, having access to good quality information and not some segments of the population getting poor quality and others better quality. We're coming to the end, but I, again, I would like to provide an opportunity to those in the audience, even Ajit, if they would like to make a comment on the quality issue. Sir. Martin. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, so I was just passing by and I saw the first question about the climate service and the rights. 
So that's what brought me in here, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Suleiman from Nigeria. I work with an NGO, and I work on access to climate information for small-scale farmers especially. So I, I think part of the question to ask is, why is there the divide? Uh, because there's proliferation of mobile services. So why is there the divide? That's one. And um, secondly, on the issue of the quality, so in, in a country like mine, and I work with the Nigeria Meteorological Agency, there is no information for livestock farmers, for instance. So there is basic general weather information, but agro ad, ad, uh, applied climate data for the livestock is not available. Um, the information that is available to farmers needs to be zeroed into their micro environment. Yep. Um, dealing with varieties. Now, that information do not go to the meteorological agency. And even if it goes, their model cannot take care of many of the varieties that farmers are. So that is the technology as well. So it means that we... And then the last thing I would like to say is that the quality of the information is as good as the accuracy. So there is need for more investment in collecting more data and the more data center, collection centers you have, the more people get involved in what goes up, and then the more acceptable what comes back is for them. Thank you very much. I, I think you very nicely um, captured the, the whole issue of a virtuous circle. You include the, you improve the quality and the access, and you get more uptake and more people appreciating your product. Um, I, for one, would love to carry on, but one has to respect people's time and, our, and uh, the t that of our speakers. I just want to thank, first of all, the audience for, for your engagement and our four speakers, Amjat, Ramana, Evan, and John. I, as I said, I struggle with a lot of digital tools. I even still don't know how to use an iPhone properly, but I do recognize um, having worked in agricultural research for development for too long now, the huge advantages of climate information, need for climate information services and the advantages of digital services. And we've had some great presentations around situation in Bangladesh, aquatic food systems, the bundling in Africa, and the key issue of quality. We just want to end this session with a mentee poll which I understand the results won't be shown on this. They'll, they'll be posted on social media. The results will be posted on social media. So in the last two, three minutes, or certainly before you leave the room, or for those online before you put the leave meeting button, if you, could, if you want to fill out this Menti poll, in the context of COP27, where you want the investment by world governments to prevent the downward spiral of farming families due to frequent climate shocks. And there's a number, 12 of them. Um, I will finish talking so that you can do the mentee poll quietly in your own time. But it just leaves me, before I turn off the microphone again, to thank the audience and all speakers and audience virtually and also in-house. Thank you.